All right, so we're going to start lecture two uh, with uh, a brief summary of what we discussed in the last lecture. So today we're going to be talking about quantum sound, right? But <clears throat> as a simple example of a quantum field. Um, summary of lecture one. Please stop me and ask questions at any point if you uh, think it's important. Uh, so we start by discussing uh, building blocks of nature. And we said from quantum mechanics and the way particle duality, we've learned that there are particles and their fields and there are uh, sort of equivalent descriptions. The particles are also described by waves, waves are described by particles. So you could construct a theory of particles, you could construct a theory of fields. And the theory that takes fields as a fundamental object building blocks of nature is called field theory. That's what the field theory is. All right, then I, I try to argue that uh, field theory using the language of fields has advantages, right? So in particular, I said, I made two comments. One of them uh, was that in relativistic theories, these are theories that appear in very, very high energies, right? Fundamental physics. Um, we saw that the notion of a particle is challenged. Defining a single particle is a hard task and at some at, at points meaningless thing, because if you try to take a single particle and localized in very, very small distances that requires a lot of energies. Energy is equal to mass. If you have enough mass, you create particles out of the vacuum, right? So the notion of a particle is a little bit icky in the presence of relativity in high energies. The other thing that we said was that in the infrared, deep in the infrared, the condensed matter theory and <laughs> long wavelength physics, there's a notion of, again, the notion of particle challenge because what you see at the particle, <laughs> what you start your theory with as a theory of particle, even the infrared, those particles might not be visible at all. You might be dealing with some quote unquote ineffective particles, some effective emergent particles that I gave them a name, quasi particles. And the quasi particles of low energy might behave dramatically, drastically different compared to the UV. Right? <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, that's going to be actually the, the second example quasi particles acting drastically different. Uh, in the uh, from, from the fundamental particles of fundamental particles of the uh, theory is something we're going to spend the whole lecture on today. But most of the course involves relativistic quantum field theory. So I want to set the foundation very well that this is inevitable. Even if you don't give a damn about relativity, we'll have to deal with this. I think the video is here, so I have to stand in front of this. All right. <laughs> so. We also made the comment that quantum field theory is intr intrinsically a many body system. We said that physics is organized in the in scales, organizes itself in terms of scales at long distances. There are quantum field theories in the IR that appear in condensed matter, and there are UV in the UV, there are quantum field theories that appear in particle physics. Now, today's lecture is going to be about how these infrared quantum field theories come about, where do they come from, and we're going to come discuss this in a very simple example of a theory of solids, right? So a solid, we're going to describe it as a collection of atoms sitting on a, an array, right? So there are a bunch of particles. Atoms are particles of this many particle description. And then we're going to see in long distances, those particles are invisible. All you see is a sound field. It's a sound field. It's the simplest example of a field emerges. Then we are going to say that... <clears throat> These fields, as we said, if they're quantum mechanical, they have quanta, they have particles associated with them. These emergent fields will have emergent particles associated with them. Those are quanta, quanta of the emergent field. These are phonons, these are quanta of sound, right? And then importantly, we'll see that the quanta of sound behave dramatically differently compared to the atoms that are building the array. So if you are a low energy physicist, studying a particle, a uh, solid, right? You're, the particles that are gonna play a role for you are not the atoms. You're gonna be dealing with phonons and their properties is gonna be key, right? <clears throat> so in particular, we'll see that these phonons in low energies are gonna be relativistic, right? So relativity emerges in the infrared. Okay, this is gonna be the topic of today's lecture. Any questions? By the way, this is just an example of a principle that is broadly what? Yes. So can you explain what you mean 
we're going to, that's going to be uh, we're going to discuss that in the lecture. But by the end of the lecture, it's not clear. We'll go over it again. The part we mean the phonons. The phonons, yes. So the phonons move with the speed more than the than the speed of sound. No, the speed of sound is going to emerge at an ultimate speed of propagation, and there's going to be an emergent Poincaré. Well, actually, Lorentz group. Once you know what well, speed of sound is a scale, you could say to one, and then setting that to one, there's an emergent Lorentz group that comes up. So you're going to see basically scalar, three scalar field here will emerge. <clears throat> All right, any other questions? But if, if I don't, if what we see in this lecture is not convincing enough, come back and ask, okay? Any other questions? All right, so the infrared field of solids. So let's start with a tuning fork, right? It's a solid, and you probably, hopefully, uh, have experience with it. If you kick it, it's going to vibrate, and it's going to, sound is going to propagate really, really well in this solid. So, <laughs> sorry, how is sound propagating? If you think of this um, solid as an array of particles, right? A, a whole bunch of particles sitting in an array like this, a two-dimensional array. As you hit it, these particles move from their equilibrium points in the lattice. They create these waves, right? So here they're more compressed. The other ones are more stretched. And because they have by, you know, like pairwise interaction, you can think of them as a bunch of little springs attaching them, right? These springs just uh, contract and like, expand and contract, and there's a wave propagating down the, the, the solid, right? Uh, there was a video that I had here, but somehow, Videos and slides don't quite work as well. It's not technology. We, we understand quantum field theory, but it's not a technology we figured out yet. All right, so, so today's lecture is going to be about a simple example of this. We're going to try to model this as a theory of particles. That's our starting point, right? So we're going to take a line. <clears throat> we're going to put an array of atoms. These, these red dots are atoms. And to model the interactions, you could think, keep in mind some nearest neighbor interaction controlled by some springs attaching them, right? <clears throat> now, when all the springs, all the uh, points are sitting equidistant from each other, all the atoms are sitting equidistant from each other, this is the equilibrium configuration, right? It's just sitting there forever. It's not going to evolve in time. But the moment you kick this, each atom or some of the atoms are going to be displaced from their equilibrium position. We're going to call that Q of site I is where atom I is, right? And the displacement from equilibrium, we're going to call that Q of I. That's the value of how much it's been displaced, right? <laughs> so displacement of an, each atom from equilibrium, Q of I as a function of time, right? The dependence on space is index I. So it's, uh, it's, it's the dependence uh, in terms of the which lattice site you're talking about. That's where space is. And time is time, right? Correct. One. For simple. Yeah. But uh, this principle is arbitrary dimensional. So now let me plot Q of I, the value of Q of I as a histogram. I think they call that histogram. Um, now, as I make my lattice, as I imagine in my head, denser and denser lattice in unit distance, unit distance, I just squeezed in more and more lattice sites. This in long wavelength, right? A long wavelength sound mode corresponds to smooth varying function. So the index i or j is going to be replaced by a smooth space variable x. And now your q of i becomes a smooth function, a field q of x, right? This is the continuum limit. You have to put more and more sites, and at the same time, make sure that the perturbation of the long wavelength enough, right? If the if you put in a lot of sites, but the perturbations are not wavelength, you're going to get something like this, which is not going to have a smooth limit, right? So you need long wavelength and very very lots and lots of sites. That's called the continuum, continuum limit, right? This is where sound comes from, and that's. A simplest example of an emergent field. So these emergent fields in the infrared we're not we're talking about are not wacky exotic concepts. It's something that we're using to let the just lecture. All right. 
Any questions? <clears throat> so today's lecture is going to be about the simple example of a theory of particles that in the infrared has an emergent field called sound. We're going to say once you quantize this theory, these waves, long wavelength emergent sound waves, will have their quanta. The quanta, of which is called phonons. The phonons are particles, but they have they are nothing like the atoms of the original atoms. They behave very different. So now, if I'm constructing a theory of nature, what is the notion of a particle, right? What is the theory? Is particle really fundamental? That would be a, the thing that we're going to try to challenge. But let's not philosophize it. Let's just work out the example. All right? <clears throat> so we're going to solve this model um, in some limit. So let's say the lattice, just for simplicity, is like a sphere, so it's periodic. Have, uh, sorry, the circle is periodic. doesn't have to be the sites. It could be a line, right? And let's say you have total length or circumference n. So you have ca n, uh, capital N number of particles. Each of them they ha has mass m, and they're sitting at position q of i, right? So when q of i is 0, that's the equilibrium position, right? They're basically sitting equidistance around this circle or on this line, right? And the circumference is n epsilon. Epsilon is the lattice spacing, right? So in physics, you always should be careful what you write there in a, about the, you should be careful with the dimensional analysis, right? So the dimension here is in m, in x, and is in epsilon, right? <laughs> All right, so we're gonna model this simple theory of solids by just saying your interaction is just nearest neighbor, right? So you're going to have a potential, which is a function of qi plus 1 minus qi, right? So if both atoms are displaced from, the, from their position, but by the same amount so that their relative distance is unchanged, they should not feel any force from each other. They could feel force from like other neighbors, right? It's just a spring model, right? If I take a spring and move both points, it shouldn't change anything, right? So what's a Hamiltonian? The Hamiltonian is just sum over i. i is a site. <laughs> Sorry. pi squared over 2m. Let's say they all have the same mass. p is the momentum, right? The canonical conjugate. Lambda is uh, spring uh, <laughs> constant, whatever it's called. And then you, you multiply it by the uh, distance squared, right? But you want it, I'm, I'm intentionally working in these units that have already made this term dimension less, right? So I'm, I'm dividing QIs by epsilon so that I construct a dimensionless parameter. It's, it's, it's a lot easier to work with it this way. All right, is it clear? Now, there could be all sorts of intra complicated interactions. In principle, this is the potential I started with. Because I wrote it as a function of a dimensionless parameter, I can expand it in the Taylor series expansion, right? In terms of powers of this. So there will be second power, third power, higher power. Here, in an approximation where these springs are very stiff, the second order, the first order, I, uh, is the simplest, is the first non trivial order. I keep that and discard the rest. Consider the rest as, as higher order nonlinearities. Now, here's a Question for you guys. I'll have these questions along the lecture for you guys to think. Why is there no n equal one term? Right? Sorry? No, it's not boundary conditions. But uh, yeah, equilibrium. The first term is because they're sitting in their, uh, their it's a saddle point, right? The first order is zero. But they're very good. That, that's why the ideal setup is that if you have a thought, just say it loud, right? And we're going to discuss it. Sometimes it's a little bit non trivial and it require you to think. Some of the questions that I'm going to have in this funky purple color involve like really, you have to think about it deeply, right? And I want you guys to poke you guys because we just have finite amount of time and we won't be able to get to uh, all of this. All right. So I'm going to set lambda to equal lambda, just drop the index and then set all the higher order ones to zero, right? This is this model I constructed. I'm truncating that disorder. Is the model clear? <clears throat> all right. So we want to solve this model, right? 
First, we're going to try to solve this model classic, right? So do you guys hopefully remember from mechanics, what we're going to, what we're going to do is that we're going to have a, we're just going to find a normal mode, right? That's the way we solve this problem. And we want to diagonalize the Hamiltonian. This is classical physics, right? It resembles quantum mechanics for good reason, but this is classical physics. You have multi-particle system of a, class, a classical system. Uh, you want to diagonalize the Hamiltonian and find the normal modes. What you do is that you basically Fourier transform, right? You take your Q, uh, Qs, these are displacements, right? Your field at each point, and you Fourier transform and go to momentum space. Now, what is funny, which is, it should be funny, is that I'm treating Qs and Ps as different entities, right? So I take Q Fourier transform it, I take P and Fourier transform it, right? This is very different from. Uh, from, from quantum mechanics, right? But it's allowed. I can I can view these as fields and I can Fourier transform them. This is like, a, if you wish, these are phase space. My phase space is a bunch of QIs and PIs, and I'm doing Fourier transform on the full phase space. Good? Another way of saying this is that Fourier transform is space time, but if that's too quick. All right. Every time you have a dynamical system, the very first thing you do, any, any reasonable physicist would do, is to look at the symmetries. Because that's your guide to solving the problem. Here we have a symmetry, and the symmetry is translation. Whoops. The symmetry is translation. If you move the position of every atom by a unit of a lattice side, nothing changes, right? So that's a symmetry. And we could try to diagonalize that symmetry. This is the transformation. The uh, discrete translation is a symmetry, and diagonalizing that symmetry is the principle behind Fourier transform. So, if you're wondering why the hell do we do Fourier transform, that's because we're trying to diagonalize the symmetry. And this is what it means to diagonalize the symmetry. The Fourier modes are going to be the eigen, uh, eigenfunctions of translations. All right, so after Fourier transform, your Hamiltonian becomes this form. We'll take this form, sum over momentum modes of pk minus k. Uh, Q, K minus K. So here's, I think I had a question somewhere, but I, I want to point out that, think about why is this minus K? It's going to be important. We'll come back to this, right? But so K mode is, this, this is what we did was that we decoupled. All these hard, simple oscillators were coupled. What we did was by diagonalizing is that we turn it into a set of decoupled uh, harmonic oscillator. That's all we did, right? Now, if you just go through this exercise, you find that the normal modes, the frequencies that come up, so the, the Hamiltonian will take this form, and these, these coefficients here, omega k, are going to be called normal modes. They're going to be, uh, so lambda is, remember, is the stiffness, the spring constant, m is m, and sine uh, norm absolute value of k epsilon over 2. Right? Is this familiar? Hopefully this, this is, by the way, I had a code that I forgot to put in there. Right. There's a famous code, I don't know who said this, but most of what we do in physics is harmonic oscillators, the collection of harmonic oscillators. Memorize this, we'll do this a million times. I guarantee you, as long as you're a physicist, you'll be doing this all the time. You better know exactly what goes on. A bunch of coupled oscillators is most of what we do in physics, right? Mathematicians find that insulting, but but that's what we do. We've got we've gotten pretty far with this. All right, good. So now I want to point out that these normal modes, that these are frequencies. These are frequency of vibrations of the sound sound frequencies, right? The sound modes, uh, the normal modes of this solid. It has the form of a sine. It's periodic, right? So if I plot it as a function of k over epsilon, omega k over omega zero, it's going to be a bunch of points like this, right? Omega k tells you about how energies depend on momentum, right? Is there a name for this relation in the physical system? What's this called? Dispersion relation, precisely. If you have, in any physical system, 
if you take a particle, whatever is your mode, and start giving it momentum, this energy scale with the momentum according to your dispersion rule. Dispersion rule is a property, fundamental property of the medium. Now, what's the dispersion relation? What's the dispersion relation in classical physics? How does energy depend on momentum? Square, right? E is like P squared, K squared, right? So omega is like K squared, right? That is classical physics. What's the dispersion for photons for massless relativistic theory? Linear, omega is like K. Here we have neither, we have sine. And that has to do with the fact that the, theory, the lattice, the, 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 the system is periodic. The first hint uh, about the emergence of relativity in the infrared comes from the fact that here, if you look at low energies, low, low momenta and low energies, there's a linear approximation. But very, very low energies, these phonons, these sound modes, I should call them phonons because they haven't quantized yet, these sound modes show energies that are proportional to their momenta. This is a phenomenon, this is a property of relativistic modes. All right, this is the very first hint as why there is relativity in the infrared. Good. Are we good? Maybe I should pause here. Any questions so far? There are a bunch of properties of this, uh, this dispersion relation that are, we'll, we'll come back and comment on them, right? There's a lot of physics you could read in this simple, simple model. Good. All right, so let's continue with classical physics. Uh, so what are the equations of motion? I just wrote down the Hamiltonian and diagonalized it. But what are the equations of motion? These are uh, Hamiltonian equations of motion, but basically, uh, oops, sorry. These normal modes, they act like harmon simple harmonic oscillator that are decoupled. So delta of Q is the Poisson of this, and then this is the Poisson of that. These are the standard equations of motion. I'm being lazy and not right, spelling them out. But once you write them all down, this is your dynamical equation of motion, right? What is this? These are those frequencies, omega k's, right? Well, after rewriting, after rewriting. Omega k squared, actually. Um, is that true? No, omega k squared on that side. Anyway, it's related to it. All right, so this is your equation of motion, right? There's mass, there's lambda. And our uh, cosine k epsilon q k, right? So you fully transform this, this time in time, right? Because q of i are functions of time. You fully transform this, you obtain this algebraic equation. This is as simple as a system can be, right? And that's what it means to say that uh, these are normal frequencies, right? I want to point out something. This is some of the advanced comment, but normal modes correspond to they're going to be signs of particles, right? These are once you quantize, these are going to be related to dispersion lines, absorption lines, right? And particles are basically appearing as were as where the at frequencies where equations of motion are not invertible, right? So in these frequencies, this term becomes zero, right? So you could satisfy these trivial, these equations trivial, right? But okay, that, that was perhaps a useless comment for uh, at this point. All right, good. So uh, let's look at our uh, normal modes. And normal modes are omega k squared that we wrote up here somewhere. Um, yeah, these are omega k, right? So at very low energies, low frequencies, low momenta, right? What do I mean by low? I mean k much smaller than 2 pi over epsilon. Remember, k is dimension full. So k epsilon, right, is dimension less. It has to be smaller than 2 pi. Much smaller than 2 pi, or uh, the, the, this is the linear approximation. This is this linear approximation I was talking about here. Right, and your omega k becomes basically proportional to k, right? So that's where relativistic limit regime comes out, and you get this simple wave equation. 
the wave velocity, sorry, the, the sound velocity, speed of propagation, is basically epsilon square root lambda over n. It's a, it's a, it's a quadratic theory. It could be the dog and solve every aspect of it. Right? So that's the speed of sound. But in this system, it's the ultimate speed of propagation. In the low energies, nothing can propagate faster than this. Remember that the function was like sine, right? So all the other derivatives were sort of small, but that, that's sort of irrelevant to the conversation. Even the infrared, the only thing you see is linear. Everything has to propagate with the speed of light, sound, right? <laughs> all right, so this was an animation, but apparently it's not working. But basically what it says is that these, these, uh, these uh, uh, normal modes, they compress and just move along, right? This is just sound propagating. So far, the whole discussion is classical, but hopefully I convinced you, hopefully, that as you take a limit where these oscillators are very, very close to each other and very, very low energies, you're going to end up with a continuous function of space that's called sound. It's a field. So sound, sound is a field on space, on ambient space. And <clears throat> sound waves emerge in the infrared, right? What else do I want to say? Deep in the infrared, and at very, very, very deep in the infrared, they're relativistic. That's all I want to say. Right. <clears throat> Before we get to the quantization of this model, are there any questions? This model should be familiar from classical physics, right? Hopefully it's seen something like Any questions? All right, so let's quantize this. <clears throat> well, I'm not gonna, so the rest of the course, starting next lecture, or well, at some point in the course, we're gonna take the continuous low energy field and quantize it. But today we're not gonna do that. We're gonna repeat the exercise we did, but quantizing the particle model of this lattice, right? And see the low energy emergent quanta of this field. The quanta of sound, which are called phonons. All right, so what is quantization? You start with these variables Q, Ks, right? So you're going to uh, promote them to operators. That's quantization, right? Ps become operators, and then you have this commutation relations, canonical commutation relations. Hopefully, I got the sign of I right. Um, and uh, so I think this is a triviality, but I wrote this in, in immediately for the normal modes. But this is equivalent to saying that the original position and momenta of lattice sites were satisfying the same computation relation because the transformation between the two was Fourier transforms linear, right? They implied if if it's too quick, do it do it as an exercise. It's a unitary transformation. It's just a rotation. I, I think I had a question. Is this clear what I'm saying? So you wanted to impose computation relation between position and momenta of atoms. I wrote down the computation relation for uh, position and momenta of normal, sorry, normal modes, right? Which were fully transformed with the original one, but these are equivalent. That's a good exercise to do. I think McGreevy in his lecture notes goes through this, but. <clears throat> All right, so what did we, ah. So here's our Hamiltonian. I intentionally discarded the K equals zero mode. We'll come back to it. Does anyone know what the physics of K equals zero mode is? This is, we haven't, we haven't quantized yet. So we're on a circle, right? K equals zero mode is, it has zero energy. Rotation. That if all these guys around the circle move together, right? The Hamiltonian is not gonna change. It's not gonna notice it, right? They're all moving together. Cause we, we wrote down a Hamiltonian as like turns that are above springs, right? If they all move together uniformly, that's the freedom that I have. Those are zero energy uh, excitations. Do you guys have any name for zero energy excitation? Symmetry. Can we use the Hamilton? It doesn't increase the energy. All right. <clears throat> All right. So now that we remember up to the, the nice thing about these normal modes is that we decouple them. So quantization of this is trivial. It's just you had a simple harmonic oscillator that you hopefully quantize in 10 million ways. You're just going to repeat that exercise with an extra index because you're decoupled set of harmonic oscillators, right? So how do we do it? The 
fancier way of doing it, instead of solving the Shane equation as a functional thing, you introduce this uh, these equation annihilation operators. There's a dagger I'm missing here. I think it's here. I'm not sure. Maybe I think that's that's where it is. Now I want to point out that keep track of this minus k sign. So here I put minus k. Here I put minus k. The question I'm going to ask you guys is that this q hat operator we define is a self-adjoint. The self-adjointness of this has to do with this minus k as opposed to k. Writing minus k as opposed to k. It's a statement about Fourier transform. It's very important in physics. So if what I'm trying to say is that if you recall, when we wrote down, when we quantized like a simple harmonic oscillator, right? We just had Q and P and we wrote combination and uh, we wrote combination of A plus A dagger, A minus A dagger. Now I have a collection of these guys with index labeled by K. I'm adding a k plus, or a dagger k plus a minus k. Think about why that's the case. It has to do with the fact that you want this operator to be self adjoint. All right. So now in this new language, my Hamiltonian looks like this. Hopefully, this is familiar. This is just simple harmonic oscillator, everything in terms of creation and annihilation modes. And then there will be a zero mode that I just add in by hand. So the zero mode, hopefully, I just argued, is simply. Uh, yeah, it's just a simple rotational mode on a on a circle. Just a free particle move. The, the motion of the center of mass motion of a free particle on this uh, around this uh, circle. All right. So this is the Hamiltonian. Let's try to quantize it. Well, we already know where it's going. Let's consider the ground state. We're going to focus for now on the single particle Hilbert space. Something profound happens here. At least to me, to this day, it still surprises me. What we're going through is called second quantization, and that's where Fox space comes from. This is a very deep statement. As I said, it still puzzles me to this day. It's not puzzling, but it's a very interesting thing we're going to observe, which is the foundation of second quantization. So I'm going to describe what we call single particle Hilbert space. And I'm going to describe why that's the deserving name. What that's, what's, that's why that's a good name. So we have, a, as I said, this theory that we just quantized is a multi-particle theory. Right? Just, we just quantize. We're just quantized as a bunch of simple harmonic oscillator. We have no notion of particles, right? At this point, it's just a multi-particle. They all exist. All these phonons exist together, right? So the ground state is uh, defined to be, if you wish, formally. That's not how we define it. But if you wish, it's like the tensor product of, of the vacua of every single harmonic oscillator, right? So each harmonic oscillator, the vacuum is defined to be the state that's killed by is annihilated by the annihilation operator, right? And um, so these the, the this vacuum that I'm gonna write as curly omega, that's omega. This is the vacuum of the theory. Is uh, it has no excitations, right? It's killed by all AKs. This is a zero particle Hilbert space. Are we good? Now we're going to build excitations on top of this. If you act with a dagger k, that creates a phonon quanta of sound, a single one with momentum h bar k. k is a label you add, right? So you could create a phonon with this particular momentum. You could create another phonon. But as long as you only have a single a dagger, that's a single particle state. You could superpose them. Right? And we get a Hilbert space of single particle phonons. Is it clear? Yeah. So, just maybe I missed Are we starting already from the Hamiltonian that is linearized in this version uh, relation? Uh, no, no, no. Omega k is both for i. Omega k's are these coefficients, right? So, you see, this is the Hamiltonian. Omega k. So, these are a bunch of simple harmonic oscillators, but their frequencies are just decided by hand. 
the, the multi particle theory for me told me that these are the right frequencies, but they're not working in like low energy. Right? At this point, no. At this point, no. I'm quantizing the whole thing. Okay, so we have not been like so you said not like it was sign. We have not taken no, we're time. keeping sign for now. We are removed uh, yeah. all uh, the pronouns. Right? Oh, these are pronouns, yeah. all of them are pronouns. So yeah, this is this is uh yeah, you're asking when are we allowed to call these pronouns? I think colloquially they're called usually usually we talk about pronouns as, as low energy, right? But people colloquially use this for some because that's your yeah, yeah. Very good question. Yes, I wasn't clear on about that. Thank you. All right. So you could superpose. So this is, if you wish, for those of you guys who are math oriented, uh, I wish there was chalk here. You have a collection of harmonic oscillators. So this is vacuum, 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 vacuum. You have different gaps, right? These gaps are controlled by omega. So this is k equal one, k equal two, k equal three, blah, blah, blah. And they have different gaps, right? Things like this. So a one particle, you could, you could call zero as a state. Zero, tensor zero, tensor zero, da, da, da. Or if you do excitation, you could, it's like a Morse code. It's like one, zero, 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 da, 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 zero, one, zero, da, da, da. As long as you have a single zero, that's a one particle state, right? Okay, these are, so we constructed something called single particle state. So here's a question that I said is D. We did this exercise, but for a second, forget about the fact that we got this as a sector of a multi-particle theory, blah, blah, blah. For a second, forget about that completely. Let's go back to the Schrodinger equation, right? Imagine I don't have a lattice at all whatsoever. I have a single particle sitting on a circle, it's free. So I just write down the Schrodinger equation for a particle, this is quantum mechanics, for a particle living on a circle. What do I find for one particle Hilbert space? I construct a Hilbert space. That Hilbert space and this Hilbert space that I just constructed as a sector, how are they related? This is a question for you guys to think about. Right? So quantum mechanics you've learned previously in your quantum mechanics courses, how to, how to take a particle and put it in a well, quantize it, how to put a particle on a circle, quantize it, picture potential, do whatever you want, right? So I'm just saying that solve that problem, you're going to construct a Hilbert space. How is that Hilbert space? How does that Hilbert space compare to this? Of course, that, that exercise will not know about omega case. Omega case came from this analysis, right? But the Hilbert space you construct is identical to this action. All right. Any questions? Yeah. Makes the particles so that like when we're when we're imposing the symmetry, the rotational symmetry, we also select it like a discrete set of chains that we put, right? Yeah, that we like to pi over and that's yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But nothing, nothing, yeah, that 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 story is from that. That is, that is. what I'm trying to point out here is that this one particle Hilbert space we constructed has an interpretation in terms of good old quantum mechanics. All right, any questions? Any other questions? This is sort of what I'm trying to point out. It's a little bit hard to see a single example. I wish we had like four or five examples. You go through them, you compare them. This example is somewhat too trivial, but you compare them and you see this point that, oh, there's an exercise you could do with single particle quantum mechanics, which is produces the, the same thing as a sector of a multi-particle second quantized. This is called second quantized theory. Um, but I'll, we'll, we'll get to that. All right. Now, there is a notion of a Fox space. What is Fox space? Um, the Fox space is all particles all at once, right? Remember we said we have a multi, we have a theory that's Intrinsically multi particle, right? So when I when I take, I have a zero particle sector, right? The ground state, this sector. I have single particle states. How do I construct multi particles? Well, I act by two of these guys. 
those are two particle states. I can superpose them with different values of K1 and K2, sum them with all sorts of coefficients. Those are two particle states. What is particle number that you know from your quantum mechanics, right? That's a, the AK dagger, AK, is the number of excitations of a particular uh, mode, right? So you could have arbitrary number of particles, all sorts of excited states. Now, these are your quasi particles. They have absolutely nothing to do with your atoms. One point is that these particles that we're calling phonons are bosons. They're indistinguishable and they're symmetric. Their wave functions are symmetric on their swap. You always have to symmetrize them simply because of the fact that A dagger K and A dagger K prime, you commute. But your at atoms that build your uh, array of atoms solid were not indistinguishable necessarily. They were not, they didn't have to be bosons, right? This is a phenomenon that emerges in the infrared for these quasi particles. All right, so what's the Fox space? You construct the zero dimension, uh, sorry, the ground state, the no excitation Hilbert space. You construct the one particle Hilbert space, two particle Hilbert space, you direct sum them. Does everyone know what a direct sum is? Direct sum is if you have a matrix like this, and you want to direct sum it with another matrix. So this is your matrix A, right? There's a bunch of elements. You just put them like this, and then you put zeros. This is direct sum. Right? You just put two blocks. So you construct a matrix by direct summing this block diagonal. So think of it, that's direct sum. There's a formal mathematical definition. Uh, there are two ways of actually making independent variables in sensing in physics, quantum uh, physics. One is direct sum, the other one is tensor product. Your actual independence is tensor product. This is not quite independence, but blah, blah, blah. You guys are not mathematicians, I don't care. Why don't we take the tensor product then? Okay. Uh, well, for several reasons. For several reasons. Um, First of all, a very good, a very clear reason is that if you, this is a this is going to be super annoying. It might give you a headache. Uh, if you take a two-dimensional Hilbert space, right, and tensor product it with another two-dimensional Hilbert space, with another one, with another one, an infinite number of them, the space you get is not countable. It's, it's a, an uncountable set. It's a famous thing in mathematics, the contour set. But that, let's not worry about that. In physics, we don't want to deal with Hilbert spaces that are, that are inseparable. But that's not the issue here. The issue is that there is a distinction between tensor product as opposed to direct sum. Tensor products, well, we'll, we'll come back to it. We'll see. The, the, the correct algebraic structure is direct sum. Maybe we won't come back to it, but it's a little bit more. Uh, yeah. I, I've always thought it was just like a single state always belongs to like a n particles typically. I mean, actually, I guess, but once you have the direct sum, you can make a superposition. That, 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 the idea is this if you have two things, h1 and h2, that you direct sum, you could construct a linear superposition of them. Right? Now, a linear superposition for a direct sum becomes a convex composition. But meaning that there are like different charts. In physics, different charge sectors are direct sums of each other, right? There are no meaning to off diagonal elements, blah, blah, blah. So they're all convex compositions, but you could superpose them. It's a meaningful to write down something like this, psi plus beta phi, where psi is in this and phi is in this. But if you have tensor product, it's not a meaningful operation. You can't say qubit one, a vector of this qubit one plus a vector of qubit two. That's not a meaningful. Thing. Something like enlarging, like if it's like in H1. Uh, so can, can you say like that either part of part of part of part in H2 is like just identity and just do that? That's it's all about like how you so <laughs> it's a set theoretic statement. If you have a two-dimensional, if you have three of these guys, right? What there are two level systems. When you put them together, do you have eight options or do you have six options? That's a, it's a set theory thing, right? 
Um, but yeah, let's not let's not worry about this. The number of options they don't multiply, just are summed. Like intuitively, they should multiply. They mm -hmm. intuitively they should add, not not multiply the number of options. Okay. Intuitively, they should add, and that's what happens in Fox space. They add. They don't multiply. Good. That's why we direct sum. If you already uh, use a simple program to the public construct the, you will only go to the tensor product uh, state. They will be all in Chinese. Uh, that, that's not the issue here because here we're we're doing linear. We're, we're talking about uh constructing how we add different particle sectors. So uh, as another as a, as a matter of fact, you'll see this phenomenon happen. Once you put interactions, you're going to have amplitudes, transition amplitudes that correspond to creating particles. That means taking, you start with a vector that had two particles in it, and you have an overlap with a vector that has four particles. In it. For such a thing to be meaningful, you should have a direct sum. Right? You can't have a tensor product. All right. You want to be able to, yeah. What's the state uh, in the software where there are both two particles and four particles? Like two, uh, zero, two, two, uh, zero, 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 like for the first law, there's a, so this is a zero vector. The second law is a uh, zero vector, and the third law would be the some uh, vector. Uh, like, uh, so, sorry, in the pop space, there is something right here. There is a total particle number, which is this, right? A k dagger a k, right? This is the total particle number, and it counts for the number of, given the state of the box. It will count for you how many particles you have, how many of them are in different ones, right? Um, so every state, so there will be eigenoperators of this, and those are different sectors of the Hilbert space. That's another way of saying this little I reject sum because these are different eigenvectors, eigenspaces of this operator. All right. Okay, thanks for the questions. These are good. Now, key lessons. We started with a bunch of UV particles. So I'm summarizing now, but I'm going to point a whole bunch of important phenomena in this simple exercise, right? We started with a bunch of UV particles. These were atoms, right? And we got in the infrared a bunch of emergent particles, phonons, collective excitations, right? I, I, I know that I haven't taken an infrared limit yet. Right, but we got after quantization, we saw that the modes that were relevant were these quantum sound modes. I want to emphasize that these phonons were not part of the original description of the theory. They came out. That's the sense in which they're emergent. Okay, so how are these different? The UV particles were distinguishable atoms, whereas the particles that emerge in the infrared phonons. These are indistinguishable and boson. They have different statistics. They're very different particles. The particles of the lattice were non-relativistic. That's why we wrote this uh, Hamiltonian we wrote, right? But the low energies of these phonons are relativistic, meaning that at low enough energy uh, momenta, uh, dispersion relation is linear. Good. One more important thing, this is a very, very crucial thing. So when we take quantum field theory, if you don't go through it this way, the reason I started this course is that once you do deal with quantum quantizing field, you always see these UV cutoffs, infinities that you deal with. And that's super confusing. Most textbooks, Peskin or whatever textbook you pick, they just watch, walk you through these infinities, adding and subtracting them. And you might, you just wonder, what am I doing? What, is, what are these infinities? So here I'm going to make, a, I'm trying to make a point of, a setup where you hopefully we give some context, some physics to these infinities, okay? That will come up later. So far, no infinities. On a lattice, there was a notion of a maximum energy for a phonon mode. The dispersion is sine. Sine has a maximum, one, after <coughs> normalization, right? So no matter how much momentum you have, your energy is not going to be arbitrarily large, right? So imagine I'm an experimentalist who is studying this quantum field theory deep in the infrared, the sound waves. I see relativistic modes and I extrapolate from the linear relation that as I increase the momentum, energy is going to go up. 
and as I go to higher and higher momentum, energy is going to go to infinity. If infinities can give us help, we will see that in quantum field theory, when we sit back and say, I'm dealing with a field, fundamental field I'm going to quantize, the fact that the energies are just like unlimited, they keep growing, are going to give us all sorts of problems. The normalization group argued by Wilson was that so um, I, I, let me just let me just say it this way one way of coming in peace with those infinities that we regular regulators sorry the existence of a fundamental lattice right it regulates these uh, unbounded energy it's as if energy keeps growing and at some point just flattens out right no more ener no energies above a certain mode are allowed. When we deal with quantum field theory, we're going to do that by hand. We're going to cut out these integrals at some arbitrary large, but momentum, we're going to call that a regular. This is the same physics. Is it clear what I'm saying? The issue is that as you take the cutoff away in that sign formula, the energy is going to grow forever. That is going to be a little bit difficult to deal with. And the way that the lattice theory dealt with it was that it provided the maximum energy. So it's like cutting the energy off. That's what we're going to do by hand in the rest of the course. So yeah. One can say that the moment we went from the discrete lattice thing to the continuous thing, uh, uh, like what uh, a regulator vanished, and so we had unbounded. Yeah. yeah. But uh, lattice is not the only way of regulating a theory. We're going to see, we're going to introduce people have been created, people have come up with all sorts of regulators. I have a somewhat of a provocative statement at the end of the, this lecture. Hopefully, we'll see. Uh, I'll see how you guys react to that. All right. So that was comment one. Comment one? No, a bunch of comments. More. So let's talk about this emergence Lorentz symmetry in the infrared. I said this before, but if you focus on deep in the infrared, your uh, dispersion is just linear, right? So if you take this smooth function, I said that in this limit, low, low energies and very, very small uh, continuum limit, right? You can, you're dealing with a function, smooth function of space and time, phi of x and t, I'm calling it here. This is the sound wave, right? Classical analysis of it. The equation of motion that satisfies is like this. Del t squared, the second derivative, minus v squared, Nabla, so in this example, is del x squared, if it's just one dimensional, is equal to zero. If I said v equal one, that is the relativistic wave equation. That is free scalar field, Klein Gordon equation. So it has the Lorentz symmetry. It has a boost transformation, there's a boost symmetry. There was no sign of it in the UV theory. This is to be understood this way, that low energy is like squinting. There is some sort of a picture, like a puzzle, and it has all sorts of uh, ups and downs. But if you just squint a little bit and ignore a bunch of things, the result you might get might have some symmetries. All right, now, another, now here's where, yes. So, we went from, uh, time independent quantum theory to this time going equation. We're, we're no, no, we had, we had time dependence all along. We had time dependence all along, right? Because if you recall, uh, these waves, they're, they're waves, they're properties, right? So here, here's where in the classical theory, in the classical theory, here's where I uh, did discuss dynamics. Ooh, ba, 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 ba. Here, here's where I discuss dynamics of the classical theory. But what comes out are just waves. Right? And the, the quantization of waves is very simple. No, all along we've had uh, we've had the analysis. So uh, just you know, just hold it down, there is the equation that uh, the one for not uh, just the the, the box equation. Yes. Basically what we're transforming that into uh, space time is the weekend now also take Yeah, this is this is this is Klein Gordon equation when we if you said we call V S equal one, this is Klein Gordon equation. Precisely. Exactly. So once we, in the next few lectures, once we do this, forget about lattice, I'm just going to take a quantum filter right in the Lagrangian, tell you guys how to deal with it. You're going to see this equation all over the place. 
But I'm just telling you where it comes from. Or one way it could appear. All right? So up to here, here is a provocative statement, but it's, it's, I think it's a deep statement or a deep thing to think about. To, yes. Um, yeah. How should I physically think about like the emergent Lorentz boost? Like, is that actually like boosting on the circle or? No, it's. Yeah. So when you, in the continuum limit, your circle is infinitely long. Oh, okay. okay. Right? So you're zoomed in. Now it's a little bit more. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now there's if, if you can see the whole you know compactness of the circle, you're never going to get yeah. All right. Um, now this court, this lecture was all on the point of from the point of view of these quantum field theories appearing because you squint and in the infrared things look continuous. The rest of the course, I also told you a story about particle physics, right? Fundamental physics, where quantum field theories appear deep in the UV. So we think the electron, the, the photons, you know, light, we think it's relativistic. Could it be that's also an emergent symmetry in the infrared that comes up because very, very deep in the UV, very, very, very large scale, like, like quantum gravity scales, there's some sort of fundamental discreteness in space-time, but when you squint a little bit, this is emergent. Could that be the case? Okay, just think about that. But then I do have a point here. I do have a point. How, how point, whatever you want to think about that question, keep it to yourself, but I'm going to make a point because this is the Wilsonian, I'm going to tell you about the Wilsonian way of thinking about quantum field theory. All right, one more, one more comment before we get to that is that I want to say phonons are real. What it means is that there is really no way of saying that the atoms of the lattice were more fundamental than these phonons. They are real in the exact same sense that those particles are real. They're all particles, they're all the same sort of thing. They, one of them is not more of a particle than the other one. To know that these are real is just like take an atom and or like a lattice and shoot, shoot lasers at it. You see these absorption lines. You're precisely the indication of existence of these phonons. So I'm not gonna discuss in detail what this, how, how this works, but it's a simple experiment. It's, if you wanna, you wanna convince yourself you, you should and could look into exactly how these phonons behave like good old particles. There's no way of saying that these are less of particles than the other ones. So we should th rethink what a particle is. Or as we're advocating in this course, we should just throw particles out of the picture to start with, start with fields, they might come out. And we're gonna spend the whole section of the course talking about how particles come out of fields. All right. Um, any questions? Just one comment here about this because I, I, I poked you guys about this. There are bounds you could put on violations of Lorentz group. Punk, uh, Relativistic symmetry in nature based on gamma rays, astrophysical, astro, astrophysical physics. And it tells you that if this hypothesis is correct, that Lorentz symmetry or Lorentz relativity is not a fundamental theory uh, symmetry of our nature and it's an emergent thing, what is the smallest, what is the largest scale at which it can break down? Right? There are bounds on this and it's absurdly small. It's very, very small. Not compared to Planck scale, of course, in Planck scale, anything goes, but it's very, very, it's got scale, basically, if you know what that is. Uh, it's like 10 to minus 30 centimeters or something. All right, so we know up until then, relativity is solid. But there are other reasons to believe. Well, I don't know if in this course we're going to get to that, but as a high energy theorist, I should tell you that there are very, very good reasons to believe that the fundamental theory is Poincaré invariant, Lorentz symmetry, is relativistic. It's not an accidental symmetry, but that's a whole different thing for another time. All right, interactions. Yeah. Uh, so let's say fundamental theory is relativistic. Uh, in general, speaking, but can we lose symmetries? Well, that's, that's, 
Absolutely. This is uh, the topic of remolization group. So as you as you go in changing scale, as you squint, what kind of theories can be in the UV and what kind of theories in the IR? Are they just completely unrelated? It turns out no. There are some infrared theories that you know some other UV, some other theories cannot be their UV. Right? They're constrained. These flows are called remolization group flows, they're constrained. And understanding the constraints of remolization group flow is one of the very active, it's a pretty active area of research. There's a zoo of quantum field theories, right? These are all the field theories that could exist. But in a sense, this picture is telling you about, they're not all independent. Some of them are actually more UV than the other ones. Here, here's one interesting thought. If you could have a theory in the UV that leads to an IR theory, the IR theory can never be in the UV of this. They can never be cycles. That's a very interesting. <laughs> so this means that why is that true? Because under roughly speaking, under when you squint under renormalization group, information is lost. There is a sense in which the IR theory is more coarse grained. All right, we stop at that. All right, interactions. Uh, we have a few more minutes. Uh, it's until 2.45, right? Okay, good. We have 12 minutes, but we're going to go through this. All right, so we saw this theory that was quadratic. And we found, uh, basically, we just diagonalized it because it was quadratic, right? Importantly, the particle number was conserved in this box, in this uh, theory, right? Because we saw that, you know, these, there were different sectors of different particles. And all of these were eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian. These are eigenspaces of the Hamiltonian, because this is a conserved charge. Now, what if phonons self-intract, right? How could that come about? Remember, when we started, we took these uh, particles and said there are springs between them, and we expanded the potential to second order. Now, let's go to the next order. Then what you do is you basically Fourier transform. This is what you got before you get this extra interaction terms. And generically, what happens is that all sorts of modes are coupled to each other. When you quantize this, you get a bunch of phonons and all sorts of terms that are combinations of A and A daggers, right? These are interactions. These are genuine interactions between these phonons. Phonons now don't go through each other. Remember, in the previous example, there these are uh, bosons. So they, they would just go through each other. They would not interact with each other. They would just freely go through each other, right? They won't. They can sit at the place as well because they're bosons, right? But here now they interact, and in particular, all these terms in the Hamiltonian are allowed. And generically, if we transform a term like that, they will be there, which tells you that the particle number is no longer conserved. This is one of the points that I was trying to make at the beginning. It's inconvenient, at the very least, to work with these uh, bases, yeah, with the particle picture. Is this point clear? There is no reason for a particle number to be conserved once you include interactions. Particles could be created, and generically they are, unless some fundamental principle forbids them. By the way, uh, do phonons self-interact? Photons, sorry. Light, does light self-interact? No. So there are examples of theories where the quanta do not self-interact, right? And there is a fundamental reason. There is a deep reason why that's the case. That's called gauge symmetry. All right. Now, Let's make this story of continuum limit a little bit more rigorous. We're gonna, so this is a long distance regime that I said things become a continuous uh, parameter. Here was, your, here, here was the Hamiltonian we start with without interaction for now. In the continuum limit, epsilon, the uh, lattice spacing goes to zero. The I index becomes a variable X, which is continuous. QI plus one minus QI over epsilon as epsilon goes to zero becomes the X derivative. So this becomes del X squared. Now, the equations of motion told you that 
PI is the canonical conjugate of Q. So this is del T. So your Hamiltonian actually is up to a bunch of constants that I could eat out. Is del T phi squared plus del X phi squared. And here I've conveniently multiplied Q by square root lambda to just make sure that the speed of sound is equal to one. I've done that intentionally. But a change of variable is always allowed. I'm always allowed to, as long as it's not changing the physics, I can do that. Oh, it won't change the physics. It's already done this, right? So the what we're doing, I just want to draw this picture again. So it's like putting a lot of these nodes and making them, just packing them in there, and then focusing on wavelength modes that are very, very uh, long wavelengths, right? So in terms of the number of sites, if I count correlation length, right, the number, how, how sites are correlated, correlation length is going to infinity, lattice site spacing is going to zero. If you don't know what correlation length is, we're gonna come back to this later in this course. All right. So this is a picture I advocated before. I'm not gonna go over it again. Very good. So now what happens is that if you, now let's go back and write down the X hat and P hat as operators that were position and momentum operators of the atoms in the lattice, right? Write them in terms of A and A dagger. Now, after this change of variable, X hat becomes a field, we call that phi, and we're gonna have phi hat of x and pi hat of x as quantum fields in space-time, the sums become intervals with the appropriate powers of epsilon. So this is a relation that if you open any textbook in quantum field theory, it's probably section one. You have these fields of space time that you quantize by expanding them in terms of creation annihilation operator that carry an index k, which is momentum, and that index is taking us. This is the starting point of most textbooks in quantum field theory. That's where they come from. That's where it comes from. All right, it comes from a continuous limit. So you have the you have the text. We're going to go through it. I'm not going to go over the plus minus signs and stuff. In fact, there might be typos in there. All right. Now let me just end with a bunch of comments. This is more question of terminology. I want to go back to this principle that I said. Could it be that uh, Lorentz symmetry, uh, relativistic symmetry, is accident? Sorry, an emergent symmetry in the infrared. From the point of view, so this is the picture of renormalization. From the point of view that I just advocated, you could be agnostic about this question. You could say it this way. At any point, my observables, my observations have finite precision. I can never say I know the exact fundamental degrees of freedom. I'm always working with some sort of coarse grain picture. All I have, I can always imagine what I have is in the infrared. With respect to some arbitrary, powerful person, I'm always in for it. The theory that's viewed this way, which is agnostic about the SUV, ultraviolet, short distances, is called an effect. There is a legitimate perspective about quantum field theory, which is all theories are effective field theories. Right? Is, is this clear? All my observables have precision. My description of it is coarse grain, smoothed out, is averaged out in a sense. Everything I ever construct in physics is going to be, these are called effective field theories. One of the principles that I, so is it clear so far? I'm gonna mention something deep. So there is a principle, when I was describing the principles of quantum field theory, I said principle of renormalization or separation of scales. I'm gonna explain that. So I have a quantum field theory that I construct and describes the motion of protons, electrons, and all that. And I don't really know whether electrons are fundamental or have tiny, tiny lattice side things and sitting inside them that have never resolved. The fact that you could construct a theory of nature 
that's predictive, that could predict for you the future without caring about this fundamental deep in the UV, that's the principle of renormalization. You don't have to know about quantum gravity to build a house. You didn't have to be like that. It's a principle of separation of scales. Fundamental discreteness of space time, whatever it may be, or if it's not discrete, quantum gravity won't matter You for long, large scale physics. You could still build a house. I think one may is still correct. Approximately correct, but it's still correct as an effective theory. The fact that there could exist effective theories is a principle that we stick to. We say renormal is a principle of renormalization or separation of scales. The UV physics is separate from your infrared. Right? Is it clear? So this is a principle. From that point of view, a lot of things that we do in this course are effective field theories. Now, as someone who does string theory, obviously there's another perspective, but we don't have to discuss that. Some terminology, lattice theory reg regulates the IR by cutting off the UV modes. Is this clear? Does it mean, is this a meaningful sentence or is it gibberish? Okay, good. So I'm gonna end with this. Could it be that all the effective, all the particle physics theories that we construct, electron field, proton field, et cetera, all of these are effective field theories. Could it be? By the way, does anyone know if Proton field is an effective field theory? Yeah, actually. Because protons are made of quarks. That's the very discovery that proton theory is an IR theory. Uh, something more fundamental, but there is no simple, even though they draw this silly picture of two up, up, down, you might have seen this. That's a big lie, big fat lie here. We don't understand the physics of this very well. This is the physics of, you know, like the, the interaction. If you take the mass of a proton and want to split it into what is made of, you want to see what a proton is made of, it's called PDF. Yeah. So there is a mass that you can associate it up, up, down. Most of it is neither of these, none of these. It's gluons. These are strong coupling, strong coupling effects, but interactions are much larger than the mass of the constituent things. So even though we say it's up, up, down is a proton, it's a very strongly coupled theory, right? All right, very good. Uh, are there any last questions? This is the end of this lecture, I believe. Yeah. Uh, by uh, separation, do you mean that uh, uh, things happen at a large scale, large grand scale has nothing to do Yes, yes, that's precisely what I mean. Uh, so, uh, can we say that uh, like microscopic surface uh, won't affect macro structure? Correct, that's precisely what I But like uh, the result of a, a quantum experiment may, may, may affect what uh, humans do, like what experiment is going to do. Right? So, uh, I find that. Uh, uh, like, uh, if we treat nature uh, in uh, from an ecological ground, uh, there's some relation between. Yeah, so okay, there are several things. Let me just say it's, a, it's a called the principle, I didn't say it's a theorem or something, right? It's a principle, it's something that we would like to believe in. And when we talk about quantum field theory, it's our underlying working assumption. There are models that are not like this. Most of the nature around us is like this, right? Yeah. Most things around us is like, the fact that we have engineering, the fact that Purdue is an engineering school, we could teach engineering, relies on separation of scales, right? We could build things, even though we haven't solved quantum gravity, right? So it's a good approximation. It works for most things. There are instances where it breaks down, and there is some sort of understanding of, in some cases, where when it breaks down. Now, what I haven't told you guys is hopefully in this course we'll get to it, renormalization. Renormalization group is this framework that we put in, to, in quantum field theory that explains how the theories change as you go from the UV to the IR, right? And that sort of puts in perspective the separation of scales. So hopefully we'll get there. If not in this uh, part, part two is going to be a lot of it about renormalization group, but it's not, the story doesn't end at what I told you. This is just lecture two of them, uh, two course, two 
to, to semester course, which is a tiny bit of a field that's developing, blah, 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 right? So the, so the, the story is a lot more nuanced, but yeah. Okay, any last questions? If not, thank you. I will post the first homework set hopefully early next week. Thanks so much.